in 1805, a spy tricked an Austrian general to lead an army of 72,000 men, out of a strongly fortified city that it might have held indefinitely, and into the open field, there it was crushed by a vastly superior French army led by Napoleon Bonaparte. The spy pulled off that feat with fake newspapers and letters. Below are 20 things about that and other fascinating espionage facts from history. Napoleon Bonaparte found himself in a pickle in 1805. It was 1805, and Napoleon Bonaparte had been at war with Britain. Since the breakdown of the Peace of Amiens two years earlier, he had a powerful army of England, 210,000 strong, camped in northern France and ready to invade Britain, if his navy managed to secure its safe passage across the English Channel. British diplomats had been busy though, and in April 1805, their efforts paid off when they convinced Russia to ally with them in a coalition against France. A few months later, Austria joined them, and Napoleon had to abandon his dreams of invading England, in order to deal with his enemies in Europe. The Army of England became the core of what Napoleon later called La Grande Army, the Great Army, and in 1805 it grew to 350,000 well-equipped, well-trained and well-led men. Napoleon wanted to hit the Austrians while they were still on their own, before they were reinforced by Russian armies then on the march to join them. Austrian General Karl Mack von Leiberich sealed off the gaps, in the Black Forest in southern Germany that Napoleon would use, if he marched to Austria from northern France, he then planned to until his Russian allies arrived. The linchpin of his defense was the fortified city of Ulm and Napoleon wanted to winkle Mack out of it. So he turned to a spy Karl Schulmeister. A spy who led an army to disaster with fake newspapers. Karl Schulmeister was a German-born smuggler who became a French spy, and inveigled his way into Austrian intelligence, he arrived in Vienna in 1805 in the guise of a Hungarian nobleman exiled from France on suspicion of espionage, and met and won the confidence of Karl Mack, commander of the Austrian army. Mack got him commissioned as an officer, and put him in charge of military intelligence. Schulmeister immediately began to feed his patron false information. Napoleon desperately wanted Mack's army to come out of the well-fortified city of Ulm so it could be more easily destroyed and a scheme was cooked up to get the Austrian general to do just that, so specially printed French newspapers were sent to Schulmeister, that contained fake news about massive unrests in France. Schulmeister shared that information with Mack, and convinced him that Napoleon had marched back home to restore order. He also informed the Austrian general that the French forces, nearby were in full retreat to suppress rebellions in France. Mack seized what he saw as an opportunity to attack the French, while they were in disarray, and marched out of the Ulm fortifications with his entire army of 72,000 men, the French were not in disarray, and numbered 235,000 superbly trained men. They fell upon and defeated the Austrians, surrounded the survivors, and forced Max surrender on October 20, 1805. Out of 72,000 men, the Austrians lost 60,000 killed, wounded, captured, and missing in the Ulm campaign. The French lost only 2,000 men. George Washington served as his own spy master. In America's War of Independence, George Washington was not just a general, he also doubled as his own spy master, his espionage attentions were most centered on New York City. When people think of the American Revolution, the city that usually first comes to mind is Boston. Among other things, we have the Boston Tea Party, the Boston Massacre, John, and Samuel Adams, the nearby opening engagements at Lexington and Concord, and the Patriots' first major military success was to force the British to leave Boston. However, New York also played a major role in the Revolutionary War. After the war's first few months when Boston was the focus of attention, New York took center stage for the rest of the conflict. In the summer of 1776, the British descended upon New York in force, and the largest battle of the entire war was fought at Long Island on August 27, 1776. George Washington and the Continental Army were defeated, and he and the remnants of his army were forced to hole up in Brooklyn. They only avoided capture there by a miraculous escape. The British then proceeded to consolidate their hold on the city and its surroundings. New York's Importance in the American Revolution New York City became the main British military base in North America, the headquarters of their high command, and their administrative center, in addition to being vital to commerce, New York's central position made it a key strategic point. It had one of the best anchorages in the American colonies, and its harbor usually looked like a forest of masts from all the sailing vessels that came, docked and went. 
it was also conveniently located relatively close to Philadelphia, capital of the insurgents and a locale they were bound to try and defend. As a result, the region between and surrounding the colonial America's two greatest cities saw the most intense and concentrated military activity of the war. It was similar to what happened in the area between Washington and Richmond in the American Civil War generations later. New York City was thus bound to become a hotbed of espionage. Compared to the Patriots, the British already had the deck heavily stacked in their favor, with a vast disparity in professional troops, materiel, and resources that the rebels could not hope to match. Advance notice of British intentions, and an insight into their plans could go a long way to reduce the impact of that disparity. To stay informed about what the British were up to in New York was extremely important to the Patriots. Their chief general, George Washington, deemed the collection of intelligence from there a vital task upon, which the success or failure of the entire war effort might depend. George Washington's efforts to establish a spy ring in New York When the British occupied New York in 1776, George Washington realized the importance of intelligence about his enemy's troop movements and intentions, after he was defeated and forced to evacuate the city in the summer of 1776, Washington directed that a channel of information be established on Long Island. It was an ad hoc and poorly run affair, without permanent agents on the ground. It came to grief with the capture of Nathan Hale, a young Continental Army officer who volunteered to gather intelligence behind British lines, only to get caught and hanged as a spy. The Hale fiasco convinced Washington that civilians would make less conspicuous spies than military officers, so in February of 1777, he requested the aid of a Nathaniel Sackett to spy on the British, and appointed a Major Benjamin Talmadge, a New York native and Yale graduate, as military liaison and point of contact. Sackett's information was hit and miss, accurate at times, and inaccurate at others. But even the accurate intelligence lacked both the quantity and timeliness to satisfy Washington, so he sacked Sackett. George Washington sets up the Culper Ring. George Washington was disappointed with other espionage operations established in 1777. His frustration with the inability to set up a reliable intelligence pipeline continued into 1778. Then in August of 1778, a Connecticut lieutenant named Caleb Brewster offered to furnish intelligence from behind enemy lines. By the end of the month, Brewster had sent in accurate reports about British troop movements, as well as the condition of Royal Navy ships after a storm and battles with the French. Encouraged by Brewster's success, Washington ordered a General Charles Scott to handle the new intelligence pipeline, and assigned him Major Talmadge as an assistant. General Scott had a full plate, however, and was uninterested in intelligence gathering anyhow. So Talmadge ended up as the de facto spy master in charge of Brewster's espionage activities. Talmadge's remit expanded when Washington ordered him to recruit more spies to gather intelligence from New York and its environs. He recruited Abraham Woodhull, a friend and neighbor with whom he had grown up in Setauket, a small community in Long Island. Woodhull would gather the intelligence and deliver it to Brewster, who would then deliver it to Talmadge and thus to George Washington, Washington who was exceptionally hands-on for a general, when it came to the oversight of espionage activities, gave Woodhull the codename Samuel Culper, a play on Culpeper County, Virginia. With its key players in place and its tasks defined, the Culper Ring was now operational and ready to shape events and make history. The United States' Greatest Spy Robert Townsend was probably America's greatest spy ever, with the alias Samuel Culper Jr. and codename 723, he became the key player in the Culper Ring. His espionage activities had a greater and longer-lasting historical impact than that of any other single clandestine operative, from the country's birth to the present. For somebody whose actions played such a great role, Townsend is remarkably little known, and he does not get anywhere near the recognition that his historical contributions warrant. Townsend never sought a claim, neither in the midst of the American War of Independence nor after, Indeed he insisted that his real identity be kept secret even from George Washington. After the conflict, a few who knew his identity whose numbers by then included Washington respected his wish to remain anonymous. George Washington personally spelled out Townsend's tasks in a letter, with detailed instructions that directed him to work out of New York City and collect all the useful information he can. To do this he should mix as much as possible among the officers and refugees, visit the coffee houses and all public places, he is to pay particular attention to the movements by land and water in and about the city especially, 
he added that Townsend should send him thorough reports on the number of troops, who operated in New York and its environs identify their units, and tell him what he could about the British defensive fortifications. He also wanted to find out as much as possible about the security measures in place to protect transports, the state of supplies and provisions, and the morale of the military and civilians. The Spy Chain from Robert Townsend to George Washington George Washington closed his instructions to Robert Townsend thus, there can be scarcely any need of recommending the greatest caution and secrecy in a business so critical and dangerous. The following seem to be the best general rules, to entrust none but the persons fixed upon to transmit the business, to deliver the dispatches to none upon our side, but those who shall be pitched upon for the purpose of receiving them, and to transmit them in any intelligence that may be obtained to no one but the commander-in-chief. Little did Washington know just how well Townsend would perform. Nor could the American commander-in-chief have predicted just how well positioned Townsend was to come across some of the war's most sensitive information. Townsend used invisible ink to write his reports on seemingly blank reams of paper that were delivered to Culper Ring spy Abraham Woodhull in Setauket, New York. Woodhull delivered the intelligence to Caleb Brewster, who delivered it to their handler, George Washington's aide in charge of intelligence, Benjamin Talmadge who in turn delivered it to Washington. The general read the reports after he developed the invisible ink with a chemical agent and often responded to Townsend with invisible ink messages of his own. The unmasking of Benedict Arnold as a traitor. To help fulfill his tasks, Robert Townsend got a gig as a columnist for a loyalist newspaper and visited coffee houses to hobnob with British officers. Many of them opened up to the spy in the hope that they would thus see their name in print. That was how Townsend learned of a British plot to flood America with counterfeit dollars to wreck the economy. His warnings enabled the Continental Congress to avert disaster in the nick of time with a recall and replacement of all bills in circulation. An equally great coup resulted from the unwelcome, but as it turned out fortuitous, quartering of British officers in the Townsend family home in Oyster Bay. One of Townsend's sisters overheard an officer, John Andre Benjamin Talmadge's British counterpart in charge of intelligence, mention the defection of a high-ranking American hero, she passed it on to her brother, and from there it worked its way through the culpa ring to Talmadge. It eventually contributed to the discovery that Patriot hero General Benedict Arnold was a traitor. It came in the nick of the time, in the late stages of a plot to betray the important American fortifications at West Point to the British. Andre was arrested in civilian clothes with incriminating documents, and hanged as a spy, while Arnold fled to the British. An extraordinarily successful spy who chose to fade into obscurity, Robert Townsend also discovered that the British knew that the French, who had joined the war on America's side, planned to send a fleet to land soldiers in Rhode Island, the powerful British Royal Navy planned to intercept and capture or sink the French at the sea before they disembarked their troops. Armed with Townsend's report, George Washington fed the British false information about a non-existent plan to attack New York City. As a result, the British stayed put in New York and prepared to defend it against an attack that never came while the French safely landed their forces in Newport, Rhode Island in 1780, that link-up between French and American armies ultimately doomed the British. The Allied Franco-American forces won effectively won the war in 1781, when they trapped a British army in Yorktown, Virginia and forced its surrender. Robert Townsend never sought recognition, and chose to fade away after the war. His wishes to remain anonymous were respected by those who knew of his exploits as a spy. He wrapped up his business activities in New York City and returned to the family home in Oyster Bay, Long Island. He never married, although he fathered an illegitimate son upon a housemaid. Townsend lived with his sister in Oyster Bay until he died of old age in 1838 and took his Revolutionary War culper identity to the grave with him. It was not until 1930, when a New York historian finally uncovered the true identity of the wartime spy master Samuel Culper Jr., that Robert Townsend's accomplishments finally came to public light. The Later Lives of a Spy Rings Members As to other key members of the Culper Spy Ring, Abraham Woodhull got married in 1781, as the war wound down, he had three children with his wife before she died in 1806. He remarried late in life in 1824, and died two years later in Setauket. By then, he had become a man of stature in local politics, and had served as Magistrate of Setauket, Judge of the Court of Common Pleas, and First Judge of Suffolk County. As to Caleb Brewster, he married a woman from Fairfield, Connecticut, after the war and settled there with her. 
the couple raised a family of eight children. He worked as a blacksmith and a farmer until 1793, when he joined the United States Revenue Cutter Service, forerunner of today's Coast Guard. He eventually retired to a farm in Black Rock, Connecticut, and died in 1827. Benjamin Talmadge served in the Continental Army until it was disbanded in 1783. He then returned to civilian life, and settled down to raise a family of seven children with his wife in Connecticut. He became an entrepreneur and entered into a variety of business ventures. Among other things, he became a bank president and speculated in land in Ohio. When George Washington was elected president, he appointed Talmadge as postmaster for Litchfield, Connecticut. In 1800, Talmadge was elected to Congress as a Federalist, and served in the House of Representatives until 1817. He died in 1835. A Mysterious Master Spy Master Spy and Adventurer George Sidney Riley, original name Zygmunt Markovich Rosenblum was born in Odessa, in the Russian Empire's Ukraine, relatively few details about his background are known with accuracy, and many of the more romanticized facts about his life might have been his own inventions. Details of his early days and education are sketchy. Although Riley led an extraordinarily adventurous life, he habitually spiced things up with embellishments, or outright fabrications to make himself seem even more exciting. At various times, Riley claimed to have attended prestigious institutes, such as Cambridge University, the University of Heidelberg, and the Royal School of Mines. In reality, he had never attended any of them. But he was good enough at chemistry to become a member of the Chemical Society in 1896, and the Institute of Chemistry a year later. He also had a good ear for languages, and mastered English, German, French, Polish, and Russian. Those gifts would serve him well in his espionage career. A Teenaged Russian Exile's Convoluted Path to British Intelligence When he was a young man, Zygmunt Rosenblum got involved with a revolutionary group known as the Friends of the Enlightenment, and acted as one of its couriers. Enlightenment was the last thing the oppressive Russian government wanted, and such politics got him in hot water with the Tsarist secret police, the Akrona. So he fled Odessa at age 19 and stowed away in a ship bound for Brazil. It was the start of years of international travel, in which he claimed to have worked as a dock worker, a dishwasher, a brothel doorkeeper, a railway engineer in India, and a spy for the Japanese government. While in Brazil, Roseblum was hired by some British explorers, as a cook on an expedition to the Amazon, he reportedly saved them from hostile cannibals when he grabbed a revolver, and shot several attackers dead. The grateful explorers invited their cook to return with him to England, saw his potential as a spy, and steered him towards British intelligence. It is possible that such a dramatic story was bunk, invented by the future master spy to hide how he got to London, which was also dramatic, although less heroic. Other accounts indicate that Rosenblum had ambushed, and killed two anarchists in Paris, robbed them of revolutionary funds, and fled France. From Ukrainian exile to British spy Whatever path he took to London, Zygmunt Rosenblum arrived in the British capital in 1895, he got married three years later, and in 1899, took out a British passport with the name Sidney George Riley. Over the years he would take out 11 different passports, all with different names. In 1899 Sidney Riley was given a permanent position, with the British Naval Intelligence Department, NID. In one of his earliest assignments, made in the midst of the Boer War, Riley was sent to Holland to gather information about arms shipments that were sent to the Boers in South Africa. The new British spy was cool-headed, creative, brave, a natural of disguises, and had a flair for acting that allowed him to don just about any persona. Riley used his talents to present himself as a Russian arms dealer, and that got him invited to inspect various Dutch arms factories. He returned to Britain with valuable information that impressed his superiors. Between that and other early successes, Riley soon earned a reputation as one of the NIN's top agents. The secret agent who spied on the Russians for both the British and Japanese. After the Boer War, Sidney Riley's spy master sent him back to Tsarist Russia, from where he reported on Russia's development of Baku's oil fields. He also reported on the progress of the Trans-Siberian Railway, and dipped down to Persia to report on oil developments there. Next he was sent to the Far East under cover of an employee of a trading company in Russian-controlled Port Arthur, Manchuria. There, Riley not only spied for the British, but also got a side gig as a double agent and spied for the Japanese, who were keenly interested in Port Arthur's defenses. 
Early in 1904, shortly before the Russo-Japanese War erupted, Riley reportedly stole the Port Arthur Harbor defense plans for the Japanese, that helped the Japanese Navy to navigate through minefields that protected the harbor, and launch a surprise attack on the night of February 8-9, 1904, against the Russian Far East Fleet. Although Japan eventually won the war, that initial attack did not go exactly as planned. Still things could have gone worse for the Japanese Navy if not for Riley. A spy disguised as a priest in 1905, Sidney Riley reportedly disguised himself as a priest in the French Riviera, in order to get close to businessman William Knox Darcy. Darcy held Persia's oil concession, and Riley inveigled him to sell the concession to Britain, despite fierce French competition. A year later, Riley relocated to St. Petersburg, where he befriended Russian revolutionaries. He reportedly spied on and reported on them to both British intelligence and the Tsarist Akrana, the self-same secret police whose unwelcome attentions had forced him to flee his homeland a decade earlier. The master spy also developed a reputation as a smooth womanizer, as one account put it, he had a seductive charm, loving women as he loved himself. A string of mistresses would fall under his spell. Monogamy did not come naturally to Riley and although he was usually fastidious in his choice of women, it did not prevent him from cavorting around London, on one of his visits with a common tart named Plugger. How she acquired her nom de travail can only be imagined. A spy caper in the Krupp gun works. In the early 20th century, Kaiser Wilhelm II kicked off a rapid expansion of Germany's war machine, that especially his naval buildup greatly alarmed the British. Their fortunes and national survival depended on the Royal Navy's command of the sea, so any potential threat to their naval supremacy was bound to alarm the powers that be in London. British intelligence knew precious little about the goings-on inside Germany's war plants, so in 1909 Sidney Riley's spy masters sent him to Essen to gather intelligence. Under the cover name Karl Hahn, Riley got a job as welder in the Krupp gun works, where he hoped to photograph the plant and the sensitive plans, and information contained in its drawing office, however the office was too heavily guarded during the day, so he volunteered for the fire brigade that worked the night shift. Then he strangled the head of the night security detail knocked out another guard, and got into the drawing room. He seized the plans before the alarm was raised, and caught a train, then a boat, and made it back to Britain with his valuable intelligence hall. A master spy with flexible loyalties Early in World War I, Sidney Riley was sent to the then-neutral United States, an important source of weapons and munitions for Britain and her Entente allies, there he got involved in the lucrative arms business. Although he had been a British spy for over a decade by then, and Britain was now at war with Germany, Riley did not let notions of loyalty get in the way of profits. In 1914-1915, for example, he arranged weapons purchase deals for the army of Britain's Entente ally Russia, as well for the Entente's enemy the Imperial German Army. While in the US, Riley might also have conducted some false flag German sabotage operations on behalf of the British, to arouse the American government and public against Germany, Riley's profits as an equal opportunity arms dealer took a hit in 1917. When the U.S. joined the war on the Entente side that year, he was no longer able to sell weapons to Germany, now America's enemy. Later that year, the Russian Revolution erupted, and the Russians ceased their weapons purchases. A star secret agent's return to espionage with his business as an arms dealer in decline, Sidney Riley returned to Europe and his British spy masters, they sent him behind German lines on various missions to carry out espionage in occupied Belgium or Germany. He used a variety of disguises and forged identity papers. He sometimes presented himself as a peasant, and at other times as a wounded German soldier or officer on sick leave from the front. In April 1918, Britain's MI6 sent Riley to Russia, whose new Bolshevik government had signed a peace treaty that took the country out of the Entente, and out of the war against Germany. The British hoped to overthrow the Bolsheviks, and replace them with a new and more sympathetic government, that might rejoin the war on Britain's side. To that end, Riley got involved in a variety of plots intended to destabilize the Reds. That spring and summer, he tried his hand at a variety of failed schemes. They included an abortive plot to bribe Kremlin guards and get them to launch a coup, and a plan to assassinate Vladimir Lenin that wounded but did not kill the Bolshevik leader. The End of a Master Spy After the failed attempt to assassinate Lenin, Sidney Riley was forced to flee the USSR, 
and he made it out of the country just a step ahead of the Soviet secret police, the Chika, the Reds tried him in absentia, and sentenced him to death. Riley's endeavors to topple the Bolsheviks had not met with success, but Britain's MI6 appreciated the effort and awarded him a military medal. However, the failure gnawed at Riley whose time in Red Russia had turned him into an implacable anti-Bolshevik, and he begged for an opportunity to have another go at the Soviets. His bosses declined, so the master spy decided to wage his own anti-Bolshevik campaign. Unfortunately for Riley, he had found his match in the Reds, whose deviousness was equal to his own, Soviet intelligence created an anti-Bolshevik organization known as the Trust, that was actually run by their own secret police, Shika. Trust members met Riley, and lured him to Russia, under the pretext of a secret summit meeting with its anti-Bolshevik leaders. When he crossed the border in 1925, Riley was arrested and taken to Moscow's dreaded Lubyanka prison for interrogation and torture. He was eventually executed on November 5, 1925.